I'm going to read a little bit longer passage than I normally would. I'm going to read the entire 15th chapter of Luke. These are three parables that Jesus told, but all around a common theme. So listen for God's word today. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or, what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, and then sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, then she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. And so the man divided his property between them. And a few days later, the younger son gathered all he had, and then he traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself to one of the citizens of the country who sent him out to the fields to feed the pigs. And we, he would have gladly filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to eat and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up. I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. And so he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. The father ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the slaves, Quickly, Bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. And put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. When he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. And the slave replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then the son became angry and refused to go in. So his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you. I've never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost, but has been found. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, draw near to us once more. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. 
for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. About 20 years ago, the Polish poet Wisława Zimborska won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And so here's one of her poems that I especially like. It's called A Contribution to Statistics. Out of a hundred people, those who know better, 52. Those doubting every step, nearly all the rest. Glad to lend a hand if it doesn't take too long, as high as 49. Always good because they can't be anything else, four, well, maybe five. Able to admire without envy, 18. Living in constant fear of someone or something, 77. Capable of happiness, 20-something tops. Cruel when forced by circumstances, better not to know even ballpark figures. Only taking things from life, 40. I wish I were wrong. Hunched in pain, no flashlight in the dark, 83, sooner or later. Worthy of compassion, 99. Mortal, 100 out of 100. Thus far, this figure remains unchanged. Many years ago, Jesus told three parables about being lost and being found, and statistics seem to play a role in every one of them. One lost sheep out of a flock of 100. One misplaced silver coin out of a precious hoard of 10. And one lost son from a very small household of a father and two boys. At first glance, this parable of the prodigal son seems to be largely about statistics. One father, two sons. One stays home, one goes astray. Statistics tell us there was probably a 50-50 chance that was going to happen. Two sons, one inheritance. Now the law of the day said that the elder son would get two-thirds of all the property, but the younger son would only get one-third. And so he unkindly asks for his portion early, takes what he was given, and then he walks away from home, from his father, from his brother, reducing everything by 33%. Now, at this point of the sermon, some of you may be hoping that I'm going to go into graphic details about what happened next, about what exactly the dissolute living was upon which the prodigal son lost his inheritance. But I'm sorry to say the scripture actually doesn't go into details here. Was it? liquor or sex or drugs or online gambling or some cryptocurrency Ponzi scheme? We're actually not told in detail, but rightly so. The parable of the prodigal son was never really a morality play. The prodigal son, it's true, made bad choices and had bad luck. There was a famine. There were a series of unfortunate events. But basically, it's a story of a son who unwisely left home and hits rock bottom. As human beings, we focus in on that detail, and we want statistical evidence. Should he have, by the percentages, known better? How does he stack up in behavior with his peer group? But from God's perspective, when God watched the prodigal hit rock bottom, God only cared about one thing. What was he going to do next? We're told that the young man is broke. He's hungry enough to want to eat the slop given to the pigs around him. But in that moment, Scripture says, but he came to himself. And that has to be a pivotal moment, or at least it has to be an important moment. He came to himself. He saw where he was, who he was, and what he had become, and he knew he had to change. Remember when you used to use a small dial to tune in your radios at home 
to the stations that you wanted to listen to. Sometimes the tuner wouldn't be set quite right, and so the station would come in badly, staticky and distorted. And so you had to move that dial to the right spot to hear the music properly. I suppose a modern equivalent of this is a cell phone that you're out somewhere where there's poor coverage so that you only have one bar and your phone keeps breaking up when you call someone. To fix that, you have to move. You have to get to a better place if you want a strong and a clear signal. When we are out of alignment with God and when we come to ourselves, it means we become aware that something has to change. And the theological word for this is repentance. Now, repentance is an important word for Lent. It means a coming to our senses of knowing when we're out of tune or maligned or distorted and that something has to change. Sometimes repentance comes when we think too much of ourselves when we're filled with pride or vanity or when we're impatient or prejudiced. But sometimes what we have to repent of is when we think too little of ourselves, when we don't really believe things can get better, when we think we're stuck, that we're just not worth the effort and we'll certainly never get the prize. The prodigal was guilty of both of these extremes. And if we're honest with ourselves in many ways, so are each of us. So as I mentioned, at this point in the story, the prodigal, we're told, came to himself. This was an important moment. This was a time of repentance. But that's actually not the real point of this parable. Not entirely. To understand the full parable, we have to back up a bit and consider another person. We have to consider the father of the two boys. Now the father's main part in this parable only comes at the end when he welcomes home the lost son and when he tries to convince the elder son to enter and join the party. But from the moment that the prodigal walked away, the father was a very active part of the drama. The father had a household. He had an estate to run. He had another son. He had workers, all of whom were relying on him, looking to him for stability. So the father had a balance keeping an eye on the family business while always keeping an eye on the road, hoping to see his other son return. Now, all of that was true before the prodigal came to himself. All of that was happening before the young man brushed off the dirt from the pigsty, brushed off and repented of his sins and folly, and then turned and set his face to return home. The father's love precedes everything else that happens in this parable. That's the only way then the last or the core verses and the heart of it actually make sense and are good news for us. Listen again to verses 20 to 24. So the prodigal set off to his father. But while he was still far off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion and ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I've sinned against you and heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father called to his servants quickly, Bring a robe, the best one, put it on him. Bring a ring and sandals. Get the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. The son of mine that was dead is now alive. The one that was lost is now found. In the little bulletin sidebar, I quoted Max Lucado, who said, Mercy gave the prodigal son a second chance, but grace gave him a feast. American evangelicals have always put a lot of weight upon repentance, about tearfully throwing ourselves at the throne of grace, seeking God's forgiveness. And there is a place for repentance. There is a need to weigh ourselves, our actions and our inactions, in the larger scales of righteousness. 
And that is important, but it's not the whole story. The prodigal came to himself when he stood up from the pigsty, when he repented and turned his face toward home. But the prodigal became himself, fully himself, a beloved son and child of God, when he lost himself once more in his father's embrace. Mercy lets us back on the property and gives a second chance. But grace, grace runs to embrace and puts on robes and rings on our fingers and throws for us a party. The Presbyterian faith has long reminded us of that very simple yet profound truth. We are saved by grace through faith. Say it with me. We are saved by grace through faith. Now, faith is important. Faith is the coming to ourselves, the standing up, and knowing the direction that we need to face is toward God, toward Christ Jesus. But that act doesn't save us. Grace saves us. And grace is unmerited, freely given, ever available. It's like the Father's persistent gaze down an empty road. It waits for us to find ourselves in its embrace. There's a preacher, Frederick Beekner, he put it this way, people are saved by grace. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to do. You're saved by grace. The parable of the loving father and the prodigal son is very appropriate for these days because where we find ourselves now, we all need to come to ourselves. That means asking big questions. If we are not living in ways that preserve this earth and society for the sake of our children and grandchildren, then why in heaven's name not? And if the way that we get our information, if the ways we communicate with one another only are leading us to division and demonization and mistrust, then how do we need to communicate differently? And if the ways we protect ourselves in the world only involve weapons of destruction, then where have our priorities gone wrong? And at the same time, even as we ask these bigger global questions, it's appropriate that we also ask personal questions, small questions. In spite of darkness in my life, where have I known light? In spite of my weariness and my uncertainty in these days, where have I felt peace? When did I last smile? When did I last feel loved and seen and valued? And how can I stay tomorrow in those places a bit longer than I stayed there today? Light, peace, laughter, being seen and valued, they come from being held by God. They come from being saved by grace. Because second chances are nice, mercy is nice, but what we need is grace. So to pull this together, Jesus doesn't mess around with half answers when he decides to tell a story. On that day, he looked around at the powerful and the powerless before him, and he had the exact same gaze as he told them all about sheep and coins and a feast to which all were invited, the prodigal and the elder son. And with each of them he said, Look, the lost have been found. The dead are now alive. What could be more important than that? Which brings me back to Zimborski's poem. Out of a hundred people, out of us right here, some of you know better, about 52, Some maybe doubt every step, perhaps all the rest. 
Many of you are glad to lend a hand, even if it doesn't take too long, about 49. A few of you are good because you simply can't be otherwise. Some of us can be savage in crowds, cruel when forced by circumstance. Some only take from life. Many are hunched over in pain, no flashlight in the dark. But even Zimborska ends with a word of hope. She says, how many are worthy of compassion? Ninety-nine. And at that point, Jesus interrupts with his own statistics and says, ninety-nine are worthy of compassion? Let me tell you about a shepherd who searches for one lost sheep, a woman who sweeps for one lost coin, and a loving parent who welcomes home every last prodigal. Such is the nature of God for you, for me, for us. So for all of this, thanks be to God. Amen.